Good evening, all. Thank you for joining us for our Crucial Conversations. This is our fifth installment, and I'm elated to have the mayor of our great city, Mayor Dominic J. Sarno. I'm also elated to have the Commissioner of Health and Human Services, uh, Commissioner Helen Colton Harris. And I'm also elated to have the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for the City of Springfield, Attorney Talia G. So we're glad to have you guys here with us uh, at Mount Zion Baptist Church. Uh, and we're so pleased that you've joined us tonight to have a robust conversation regarding several issues that impact our community and our city. So the first question I have, and it's for all three of you, what would you describe as the mood of our city and the mood of our country? I think right now uh, it's a very highly uh, sensitive time, uh, not only in our country, but uh, the city of Springfield. But we've been able to foster and continue to develop uh, positive relationships. But with everything that has gone on uh, in the country, again, it's, it's a, just a very, very sensitive time. Uh, people are looking uh, for change, positive change. I think people are looking to work uh, together. I think what has uh, compounded is uh, uh, dealing, uh, and we will uh, defeat this COVID-19 coronavirus. And I'm glad your family members, uh, uh, Pastor White, are feeling better. And then Helen, Commissioner Helen Carlton Harris has done a tremendous job as my point person on the COVID-19 coronavirus. But if you ask me for a couple words, I think it just, it's, it's a highly uh, sensitive time, which potentially leads to uh, charge times. Um, I echo the, the mayor's sentiments. I think people are um, tired. I think people are very emotionally raw n right now. Um, I think all of us have a little PTSD from watching the horrendous, um, <clears throat> excuse me, death of Ahmaud Aubrey followed by uh, George Floyd. And so I think um, that has awakened emotions across the country. It has added a layer of um, frustration and fatigue on top of dealing with fallout from the coronavirus. So uh, whether that be financial impacts or health impacts or um, even the, the, the loss of socializing and human touch and human, in, human interaction, I think people are just very raw right now. As a city in the country, I think we are at a crossroads. I think uh, the crossroads in this nation has to do with two things, uh, maybe three. The economic disparities that many individuals are feeling as they're feeling a loss around their ability to make a living wage and take care of their families. I would also say COVID-19 has pulled off the Band-Aid on rapid health disparities that we have not only in this nation, uh, but in the city of Springfield. And I also think that individuals are feeling angst around the racial unrest that we're feeling across this nation, uh, turning on our televisions every night and being bombarded with COVID-19, with racial unrest, and with individuals who are unable to uh, pay their bills. So while there is uh, some positive that's going on across the nation, and certainly uh, in the city of Springfield, we are in a crossroads time. And I think we all have to be aware that the decisions that we make today are going to um, really have an impact on our outcome futuristically. Thank you, thank you. So uh, Mayor Sarno, on Tuesday, uh, June 16th, you gave an impassioned speech uh, about how racism is a public health crisis in the city. And you took extraordinary steps to create a new office to address the issues uh, of racial equity within our city. So the question is, given the largest protest we had in the city uh, before June 16th, it was uh, organized by young people, uh, over 3,000 yes. people, I saw you there. Yeah. Um, and uh, all the marches that we've had in several different yeah. respects, how has that impacted your administration? Well, first of all, I, and I, I've said it in my comments, too, uh, on the peaceful protests uh, that have occurred, and Springfield's really led the way, uh, uh, and that was important. That was important. And I think what was key, though, Pastor, was the – I continue to have meetings uh, with my black senior leadership, of which is comprised – two are here, Commissioner Helen Carlton Harris and Attorney Talia G. Um, 
That was about a three-hour meeting, Helen, wasn't it? Yes. It was very enlightening. And I've also continued to have uh, meetings uh, with uh, other black leadership, uh, with uh, residents, private conversations, groups, and even advocates. But I think the biggest thing was that meeting I had, Helen and my other uh, cabinet heads and department heads, uh, black leadership, senior leadership in the city of Springfield. And a lot of things that I, I was aware of, some things that I, I wasn't aware of, uh, whether w within the city uh, limits or city hall or outside the city. And it really opened my eyes uh, a lot that this COVID-19 coronavirus, Helen and I talked about this all the time, about doing some things down the road and the disparities. And then the tragedy, tragedy that occurred to uh, Mr. Floyd. So it really drove me to say, we really need to, this office of uh, uh, racial equity, set it aside, and also shifting some stuff off the plate, uh, the police department, Commissioner Clapper, and I wanted it, because it's a health, it's a health issue, health issue. I wanted it under Health and Human Services, under Helen Calton Harris. So what we're doing, and the office is evolving, and I started with some seed money, about a quarter of a million dollars, some that I took from the police department, is to, on the cultural sensitivity, diversity training, also to stop this uptick of uh, gang and gun violence across urban America on street workers. But the main thing is with Helen and really driving some, a lot of this training and outreach to the community. And you'll see in her description, we're going to meet, continue to meet with community members, business leaders, religious leaders, get their input. Some things we might already know about, some things I might not know about. How do we incorporate that? And, and so this will go not only for uh, you know, mental health training, uh, cultural sensitivity, diversity for our officers within, uh, and how to deal with, with our community of all three colors and backgrounds, but also for them inside, too, to deal with this. And Dee Moss, Daryl Moss, my office is here, a, uh, a street unit, street cred, to be out there to defuse situations, help these uh, uh, individuals, uh, gang or uh, the, the gun activity, that there's a better way to go, work with their families, facilitate with a government, private, nonprofit, and even at times, if there's that ray of hope, glimmer of hope that somebody can be saved, advocate for them in court. But we have to stop this sense of, so that's how it came about. And I'm going to do some other spin-off stuff, uh, economic development on the workforce. But Helen, I, I wanted a different look. I wanted it from the perspective, the eyes of Commissioner Helen Colton Harris. Health. This is a health. It's a, uh, a, a crisis that has occurred. And, and racism ha has really shown that it, it's pervasive. You could see it in all different walks of life here. And I think that it's a difficult conversations that we've had. We've made a lot of strides, but there's more that has to be done. I want it done structured and under Commissioner Helen Colton Harris, with the assistance of Attorney Talia G as our Chief uh, Diversity and Inclusion Officer. So let's take a, a quick step back, uh, Commissioner Harris. How would you, what's the working definition for racism uh, that you use? What's the working definition for it? So racism is uh, individual, so racism has to do with oppression, racism has to do with oppression, um, and it has to do with uh, power. And so individuals who have power uh, become agents of oppression, and then there are individuals who have less power who are targets. And individuals use that power potentially in order to have individuals feel like they're less than, in order to make decisions based on hiring, uh, housing, the social determinants of health. So racism is really power, using your power uh, to denigrate, oppress other individuals who have uh, less power. And that has to do uh, with prejudging and, again, oppression. So, so that, that segues, uh, segue to you, Attorney G. So in your role as the first uh, chief diversity and inclusion officer for the city of Springfield, uh, I think you started around January 2019. Uh, tell us what your role is and what's your responsibilities. So my role is really to make sure that oppression, racism, and 
all of those other isms that are along, along those same lines don't creep into the hiring process, first off. It's really to make sure that um, everyone, no matter race, color, or creed, has the same opportunities for jobs with the city of Springfield, and that the process of how jobs are obtained is fair. In addition to that, I also make sure that um, the work environment of our employees is fair as well. Oftentimes, that includes communicating um, and interfacing with the community, and so I'm often out in the community um, to not only advertise um, for our jobs, but also to hear feedback from the community about what it is that they want to see in terms of um, services or jobs or things of that nature. And from your perspective, why is diversity important uh, in the workplace? The first thing is that it's the right thing. Um, and the second thing is that statistics have shown that when an organization is diverse, it runs in the best way. Um, we have a very diverse population in the city of Springfield, and so it only makes sense that all of us who work for the city and service this community are diverse as well. Great, and, and so that, that's excellent uh, as we think through what it will uh, entail as we really process uh, this new office. And, and so one of the under, uh, one of the linchpins, should I say, to our conversation is the social unrest in which we're experiencing the protest um, around police brutality. And we've had cases here in Springfield, the most popular recent case is the Nathan Bills case. And uh, Mayor, you uh, were quoted as reversing your decision yes. to hire back those police officers. And so what's trending on social media tonight uh, is an article that was posted on Mass Live regarding a Latina police officer who was terminated, which seems to be immediately for posting um, a Black Lives Matter image on her Instagram page. Uh, and they're contrasting it with the slow response yeah. with the Nathan Bill officers who were involved. Yeah. So I just want you to speak to sure. that tonight. I'm glad you asked that question. On the, with the Nathan Bill case, just briefly, uh, that has uh, uh, troubled me and that has also aggravated me at times. The Civilian uh, Community Police Hearing Board was ready to go with that. I brought in a retired uh, uh, jurist, well-respected Judge Bertha Joseph. I want an independent look and an independent attorney. Every time we moved to prosecute that case, we were told whether by the district attorney, the attorney general, or uh, DOJ, the feds, hold off, we're gonna pursue that. Uh, lo and behold, uh, we're five, six years now, five, six years, so that's become very, very aggravating because there needs to be uh, a closure either way and where, where uh, penalties have to come out, penalties have to come out. So you fast forward what happened to the, uh, the uh, police officer uh, with the social media. As you know, uh, a few years back, I uh, made sure to put a social media po policy in place. I was livid, livid after Charlottesville, uh, one of our officers, uh, the comments that were made there uh, pertaining to peaceful protesters. And uh, we moved through the commissioner to fire that individual that was appealed all the way up to the, uh, the court system, which was upheld on that. And then recently, we had a firefighter uh, that made comments again toward with the peaceful protesters. This is about both these harming peaceful protesters. Not only did uh, Commissioner Calvi make the, the right move there uh, in dismissing uh, that individual, the National Guard got rid of that individual. This individual with the police department, we have to be consistent and there can't be a, a double standard. This individual this on probation, this is the second issue uh, that this individual has. So now with the first two, you had individuals saying about uh, wreaking havoc or doing all the way up to uh, hurting or harming or, or killing peaceful protesters to now the other side where the individual comes out to say that shoot cops. So it cannot be a double standard. This was the second issue. This, uh, this uh, person was on probation and I concurred with Commissioner Claproot's decision uh, to terminate her. It's unfortunate, but again, we're not. These comments are wrong anytime, Pastor, anytime. But as has been indicated uh, with Commissioner Carlton Harris and with Attorney Talia G, it is such a highly sensitive time uh, in our country uh, right now. And I'll, last thing I'll say is 
those meetings I had with Helen Talia and others, two things struck me. What happened to Mr. George Floyd, God rest his soul, tragic, and justice must be served. It opened up not only old wounds, it opened up present wounds. And then one th was said by one of the, uh, my cabinet uh, members, my senior leadership there, you know, Mayor, we know, you know, we know how you want it, but to walk in somebody else's shoes and things that I heard that, that I would never expect because I have the ultimate respect for these young ladies. Oh, I wouldn't think somebody would have to go through that. And that really, that really struck me about making, and I had to get people's, I wanted to get people's attention. And that's why I made that declaration uh, with the office. That's why I apologized. I'm not perfect. A mistake was, was made there. Uh, Com Commissioner Clapper, nor the police department is perfect. I made a mistake. And I meant no will, no ill will, no Ill, Ill intent to the black community. And I wanted to apologize for that. And I wanted to reverse that decision. The only reason the decision was considered at the time, we were down a tremendous amount of police officers. And it was questioned that it was legal, you could do this, and I wanted to get all hands on deck to protect our residents and business community, no matter what creed, color, and uh, background. In turn, with these meetings, it was a wrong decision. I made a mistake, I admitted to that, and then I made the decision that it needed to be reversed and let full uh, uh, judicial aspects be looked at, adjudication, whatever way it goes at that point in time. So again, I didn't, I did not mean any disrespect or any ill will to our black uh, community at all. And I wanted that to be said. So that, be, besides declaring it, racism is a, 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 you know, a health crisis here in the city of Springfield, the, that announcement and then also the announcement to continue to expand powers with our civilian community police hearing board, once again putting before the city council the subpoena powers. Nobody hates a, a, a bad cop more than a good cop. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I'll always stand up for uh, uh, public safety, but when something's wrong, something's wrong. I made a mistake. I made a mistake. And I want to revisit that and do the right thing. And I've learned a lot from that situation. Um, so that's where we stand. But on the Nathan Bills, we're going on five, six years now. We were ready to roll. I think a couple of years ago, I did a press conference in the law department with Solicitor Ed Pakula, at time acting commissioner, uh, Cheryl Clapper, showing the whole history of this and how we've been trying to move independent retired judge, independent attorney, and other higher authorities, whether a district attorney or attorney general or the uh, federal government said, hold, we're going to pursue this. We're going to pursue this. So I, I have not been happy with that, that whole uh, case there. And the other situations I listed on that social media policy, it is hammered away, and especially when you're a, a public uh, a safety uh, officer, he or she, you have to be, it's hammered away about non-involvement in those situations. So we had to be, make sure we were consistent. At Charlottesville, it was a white officer. It was a white officer, and I was livid what occurred down there. And that, we, that held up in the uh, appeal case, because uh, uh, it was appealed. And then recently with the firefighter there, you know, you can't say it's okay to do uh, harm and hurt peaceful protesters, both there. And then the other side, you can't say it's okay to, to shoot and kill cops there, too. And that was her second issue while under probation. So let me, uh, since we're talking about that, let me ask you this question, uh, Mayor Sarno. Can you explain to us what the um, police review hearing board is, the police hearing review board? Can yeah. you explain to us it's what the, that it's is? It's the, uh, the community police uh, hearing board, civilians made up of residents, many of them that you know. It's a very diverse, very well-respected board of all walks of life. And this was uh, uh, created at the time when the control board was here, moving to modern policing, which meant you had a commissioner, he or she, overseeing the department on the day-to-day -day operations, the hiring and firing, et cetera. At that time, there was no review board at all, period. 
and you see a lot of executive orders being made by mayors across the country for a civilian review board, which Springfield's already had, the escalation training, which we've already been doing, body-worn cameras, which we are, which we are doing, non-chokeholds. You'll see that all across America. So at the time, uh, then Mayor Charlie Ryan put in a, uh, uh, a start of an oversight board on discipline, uh, the commissioner. Then when I became mayor, I strengthened uh, that board to review that they would review uh, decisions or make recommendations on discipline to the police commissioner, he or she. Whether it was retired Commissioner John Barbieri, retired Commissioner Bill Fitchett, or now Commissioner Cheryl Clapper, they've always abided by those rulings, or if not more, on it. So what I've done again is put in, and the city council can grant these powers, subpoena powers. And Talia have told you, and I made some internal adjustments too, which Talia is heavily involved in too. Some cases were very frustrating. Couldn't get all the information, couldn't get all the witnesses because there was no subpoena power. Now, the last thing I'll say about this, so the council can grant them that subpoena power. So we do, for the, we do we've had a civilian review board. Uh, Attorney Ernesto uh, Castillo just spoke to him today, he called me, and they've done a tremendous job in a difficult situation. Now, this is not coming from me, you know, Mayor Sarno, uh, Sarno, Dominic. Attorney G will tell you, and I think my, my former chief of staff, uh, Denise Jordan, who's my chief of staff for 10 and a half years, the first, first black chief of staff ever in the city of Springfield's history. We heard a lot when I took over that many minority officers never thought they have an opportunity to proceed up the ladder. And I said, they wouldn't even take the test. I said, Mate, you're always going to get a fair shake to do that. The old police commission, uh, again, I'm not saying it was a uh, good commissioner. Here. They were involved, many a times the officer would tell you that there was a lot of uh, uh, political aspects going on there, and they would be bypassed, they wouldn't even go for it. You look at the police department now, which I believe we are at parity, and the fire department we're at parity. So under my administration now, besides sergeants, lieutenants, captains, deputy chiefs, same thing on the fire level. They know, she's told me, she goes, I heard that, Mayor. They know they're going to get a fair shake, do well on the exam, they're going to get a fair shake, and you work hard, you will be elevated. So I'm proud of that, that we've been able to do that. But it's modern policing. Uh, this is on the PERF recommendations, too. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Chuck Wexler, who's nationally renowned, that you have a commissioner, he or she, runs day-to-day -day operations, the hiring, but with civilian review oversight on discipline. And I'm trying to continue to strengthen it if the city council, and I'm looking to codify this and put it in an ordinance. And they can grant the subpoena powers, and I made some internal moves uh, also. So there is a civilian review board. I think some of your viewers uh, uh, know a lot of the members that are, that are on there too. So just a follow-up question on, on this uh, particular um, conversation. So a few weeks ago, we had a faith and policy discussion. Uh, city Council President Justin Hurst was here and at-large City Councilor Tracy Whitfield. And they were uh, advocating for a police commission. I think that's what the name of it yes. is. So how does the Civilian Review Board differ from the police commission and, uh, and or why do you oppose the police commission? The police commission was antiquated, antiquated. And it's an old system. You had five members on there that were uh, literally running, at times, day-to-day -day operations, hiring, firing, and at times could handcuff, the, at the time, the chief at that point in time. Moving around uh, deployments to other areas of the city. You have to have, uh, it, but with the uh, your Mount, Mount Zion, you're the pastor. You had, you, he or she, you have modern day policing that running the day to day operations, the hiring, firing, but you have to have the oversight when it comes to uh, discipline, the outside look from our residents, which we do have. This would go back to the, the days that, and Talia can tell you and others that, and I know that uh, 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 Captain Larry Brown, Charlie Yeoman just said, they, many that you would not have an opportunity at times because now political games came into play and you had five members that all had different uh, views on this. So this was the modern day policing uh, on it and that's the way you should run. You know, I have Commissioner Helen Carlton Harris. That's her department. Those are her, she's the cabinet. She runs those departments. 
of course, you all have assistants on it. One person running it with oversight as far as the discipline. That's key. You have a lot of departments across the country that don't even have the, uh, uh, the oversight. I'm not saying we're perfect at all, but this is the modern day uh, policing. I want to strengthen it. I want to make it an ordinance with subpoena powers. That is key, the subpoena powers. That is key. So people work hard, they score well, they're going to get moved up, and that is very evident. You see in the ranks of the uh, Springfield Police Department and the Springfield uh, uh, Fire Department under my administration. Great. And, and as we spoke earlier today, Attorney G, you are going to be instrumental to the review board moving forward. So, and in, in that was some of the, one of the eternal changes you were speaking of, Mayor Sarno. So, can you tell us more about that? Yes. So, the Civilian Review Board. Um, reviews cases, they, they hear uh, complaints from citizens, and so I will actually be working as the attorney to that civilian review board. And so I will help uh, guide them with um, answering questions, reviewing the, um, the topics that are of importance, and making sure that they're staying on um, task when it comes to considering the real issues in the complaint. That's, that's one thing that I'll be doing. And then I'll also be taking a look at how we can improve the process in reporting back to Mayor Sarno, um, any recommendations that I may have about how the board can be improved. Great. So one of the questions that came up uh, as it relates to this, and then we'll transition after this question, uh, is around the amount that's paid out to cases where there is police brutality. And what the counselors were telling us was it's hard for us as citizens to really trace that dollar amount on an annual basis. Uh, is there a way or is there a plan in which the ordinary citizen can know um, for accountability purposes how much is paid out uh, to cases of police brutality and misconduct? I believe that is, that is public record when we do that as far as the cases and uh, some, there's some cases that aggravate me very much, uh, uh, Pastor White, and uh, there's some cases there sometimes that the law, law department will say that it's settled, even though at times you want to fight. And there's some cases that uh, the department did wrong, but that is, uh, that is public, uh, uh, public knowledge on it. Uh, here's a question from um, our listening audience, uh, and this is just for information. Has there been any further investigation on the young man, Akeem Bailey, who was uh, found dead in the river? Do we know any more about that? They did. A, the full investigation was done. I know the family very, very well. His uncle Orville and I were dear, dear friends, and we were basketball teammates at the, at the Oak Kiley, uh, Junior High School, we're starting guards, and you know, being in your beautiful church here brings back tough memories for me. This was Death Valley. Played a few games here. We never won. Big Will Express took it to us many a times, and when you went in for a layup, let me tell you something, you went in hard uh, into the wall there. So there was uh, a full investigation. That was just such an unfortunate and I also, through my uh, licensing director, Attorney Alicia Days, called for more hearings where I did penalize uh, that establishment at that point in time for how that was handled. It was unfortunate what occurred and I, uh, Hugh Bailey, Mr. Bailey, we've spoken a number of times uh, too, and and um, it was a terrible situation that uh, occurred. There was no uh, foul play, but the process that occurred before that uh, was was questioned. It was questioned, and I did penalize that establishment through my licensing director, Attorney Alicia Days, on it. So they did have a full investigation. Tragic death um, that occurred, and. Uh, um, I know the Bailey family c continues to, uh, to grieve on with the loss of the young man. Thank you. So, Commissioner Harris, uh, what is the vision, if you will, for the Office of Racial Equity? So, the Office of Racial Equity, let me first by saying violence um, has been a uh, public health issue for a good many years. C. Edward Koop, who was the Surgeon General in 1984 declared that violence and racism are public health issues. 
And so we, in the Department of Health and Human Services and across the city, uh, will be looking at racism through an equity lens. And what that means is structural racism, looking at the structures that we have currently, and uh, really doing some assessment around what do those structures look like? What are the uh, boards of those potential structures looking like? Where are people uh, in the executive levels of those structures? We uh, intend to work with the community, the faith community, the business community, um, as well as community-based organizations to be able uh, to gather data. And remember, public health is a data-driven um, science. I call it um, the science, uh, social justice movement rooted in science, because that's really what it is. And so the vision really is around equity, creating parity and equity across the city of Springfield, having uncomfortable conversations, and bringing people along with us. But in the end, our goal is to impact the social determinants of health, looking at housing, looking at employment, looking at those areas of our life that were living wage uh, jobs. And that's where I think we intersect uh, with Attorney G and the Office of Diversity, because we are both going to be looking at workforce development externally and internally, and making sure individuals are counted among those who have living wage jobs. So the office will take a look at, again, looking at that racism lens around people who have power, where are they positioned, and how are they um, impacting the health outcomes. We know in the city of Springfield that health disparities um, and data are something that we see um, individuals in, in the black community uh, represent it disproportionately. We have to take a look at all of that data. So it's a big job. I have a job description uh, that I have begun, um, and those areas and those goals that we will um, look at and try to maximize. I articulated much of it last night at our city council meeting as we talked about microaggressions and those kinds of things that we know are pervasive and cause us to be sick, unemployed, and really in positions that where we have no power and we are dependent um, on others with power. We have to equalize our systems in order to bring everyone along uh, who needs to be counted in our systems. Root, so root causes, that's what Helen opened my, continued to open my eyes with, with the COVID-19 coronavirus, that we don't want it to get to a police moment and look at the root causes so it doesn't have to become a police matter, the, 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 the housing, education, workforce development, health opportunities. So, so that really opened my eyes. The more money we can pump in on the early end, whether it's the preschool uh, uh, schools that we're doing now, classrooms on the city side and funding that, it doesn't have to escalate to become a police situation. So when I think of Helen on that, get to the root cause so it doesn't escalate to be a police situation. So in, in giving uh, your definition of what the vision is and it's uh, social justice that's data driven, uh, what measurable outcomes have you identified at this moment? So we know, um, particularly because of COVID-19, again, COVID-19 has ripped the Band-Aid off that what we've already known about health disparities in the city of Springfield and across this nation. And so it's important to us that we are able to uh, use the data, that health equity lens, and how will we know we're having measurable outcomes? I think one of my disappointments um, that I've watched over the years, if we have had millions of dollars come into the city of Springfield that go to agencies and organizations, and I believe very strongly they are doing an excellent job and doing, trying to do a good job, yet we have not moved the needle on health disparities. And so the question becomes, what is it that we need to do differently in order to get different outcomes in our community? And that definition of insanity, I think, is uh, prevalent here. In order, if you keep doing what you've always done, you're gonna get the same outcomes. And so how do we do things differently? Do we continue to work in silos as a community, or do we think, and through that broad lens, that our mission really is to communicate, collaborate, work together, and try to make a measurable difference in the health outcomes? Again, 
I know that individuals, organizations are getting funding in order uh, to move that health disparities needle. It has not happened. And so my vision should be everyone's vision, um, healthy people in a healthier community. And I'm talking about those quadrants of health that are four. One is physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional. Unless we are able as a society to look at those four quadrants and do the necessary work in order to fulfill um, that wholeness of every uh, human being, uh, then we have not done our job. So the goal is to look at it through an equity lens, look at it in terms of racism and racial equity, and look at all of the health disparities and try to figure out together. And it is going to take collaboration, cooperation, and working together. We have got to uh, do a better job because the young people that we're seeing in our educational system, in our school systems, and around this city really are looking to us as adults to create that pipeline and pathway for them to be healthy and for their families uh, to be healthy. And it is a huge um, undertaking, but I believe we can make some strides if we look at it uh, differently, which means looking at it through a race equity lens uh, versus uh, just a health disparities lens. When we layer the race on top, when we layer poverty on top, when we look at where people live, then we can start to drill down and say, okay, let's talk about what we really need to do and not just what we think we need to do. And so the office I, I read will be staffed by one person initially? To start. To start. And so what type of candidate are you looking for to uh, really launch this program and to stand behind this program? As I said, I do have a job description with a number of skills. And so what type of person are we looking for? We have to have somebody who has credibility with the community. That is important. It's also important the educational requirements. And so I don't want to uh, minimize how important it is to have someone who understands public health, who understands prevention, intervention, and treatment, who understands primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. However, given all of that, we also need someone that the community feels comfortable with and who is able to structurally create those systems together with the community that is going to get us to that outcome. We are looking to the community to help us uh, with the mission and vision. You ask me what my vision is, and so certainly I have a vision and outcomes I want to look to. But unless we have the community at the table with us, helping us to create that vision, because you can speak about people, but you can't speak for people. And unless we have those people at the table so that they can help us shape this, people will support what they help to build. And so I'm going to ask the community to help me build the Office of Racial Equity so that we all are invested in those health outcomes that I talked about. And so how do you plan to solicit uh, community support or buy-in? The community support and buy-in will happen um, with those community conversations that we're going to have uh, with the different sectors that I talked about. The different sectors, meaning business, um, um, as well as community-based organizations and families. And families really are at the center when we talk about youth, one of the things that we uh, don't do a good job of oft times, and I know many individuals do, is while the child is important in terms of the family, we've got to bring the whole family along with us. So we will also have discussions with our families as well as um, with those sectors um, that I talked about. Again, um, people uh, support what they help to build, and I am on a mission personally to hopefully build that legacy that says that we have a foundation that we can work from and everyone who we speak to uh, builds into that foundation that we stand on. And so that is really what I'm hoping and I have gotten so many telephone calls and I've gotten so much support around the community who um, are completely saying we are, we're there. Um, we are understanding what the mayor is um, wanting to do we are understanding what the public health vision is, health disparities as well as the social determinants, 
and we are there. And we understand that the conversation has to be a new conversation, maybe with some of the same components. But again, I think we as a community have to have uh, a different lens to look through. Uh, and I believe the lens of racism and racial equity is going to get us there if we can uh, begin to have those uncomfortable conversations, not just with the community, but certainly um, with those individuals who um, are in power, who may not be, uh, who may be uh, not black, but understand that they have power that we ask them to use in order to support um, rate, uh, support a racial equity lens. So uh, at our first crucial conversation when we discussed faith and policy, I asked uh, State Senator Eric Lesser a question around what does it mean uh, when they're saying defund the police in that movement? And his explanation uh, was basically it means a reallocation of funds to support education, community programs, et cetera. Not necessarily defunding the whole police, but it means a reallocation of funds. So for this new office, I read, uh, Mayor Sarno, that you were reallocating funds uh, from, I think, the police overtime yes. to this initiative. Can you speak a yes. little bit about uh, that decision? $125,000 from the police overtime funds, plus another $125,000 for a quarter of a million out of the city budget. And I did this in discussions, not only with Helen, but Commissioner uh, Clapprood and with my CFO, TJ Plant. What could we do within reason, because I, I don't want to take away from the, the services that our residents uh, expect and business community to keep us all, all safe. And that was doable. And, and Commissioner Clapprood had indicated a few weeks ago, as I did, Helen speaks about, too, the COVID-19 coronavirus uh, press conferences, which we do at Bay State, Dr. Kerouac and, and Dr. Roos from Mercy, that the commissioner indicated, Commissioner Clapp, that we need to start shifting some stuff away from the police department. And, and I said, we're going to pursue that, not wanting the harm that we have to have public uh, safety. That's extremely important for all residents, no matter what creed, color, and background. So I me made that move on my own, saying 125 out of the police overtime account and another 125 for 250 to put in there. The, by saying defunding the police, you play right into the hands, the buzzwords of the, uh, the, uh, the extreme sides there. So when people hear that, they say, are you going to shut down the police department? Who do you call? What I know is reallocation, the reshifting. And this is how strongly I felt about it, looking through Helen's eyes. Okay, we could have done this stuff within the police department. No, I wanted it outside the police department. I wanted it under health and human services on it. So what happens when you use that word defund with anything, any department? No cabinet head or department head wants money taken away from, but it was done in a constructive way that's going to, in the long run, benefit all causes. But by using the word defund, uh, uh, you know, extreme sides and both sides will use that saying, you're going to get rid of the police department. So that's what we say about reallocation uh, of the money. So that, that's, become, that's become a buzzword, um, and it's, it's been used in a negative uh, aspect. I've always said this is about reallocating funds from the police department to help the whole community and to help the police department take some things off their plate, the uh, mental health. And I wanted more training in the police department. They have it now. But I wanted to be looked at another set of eyes, Helen's eyes, on the cultural diversity, mental health, sensitivity uh, on it. Different perspective coming in uh, to do that. And I wanted the, uh, the street workers and working with Daryl Moss, who's done it for many, many years. I met him many years ago when I was at DA Bennett's office when the MLK helping to straighten out kids who are borderline hardcore. And Ed Casey, Sheriff Nick Coach, he's been great. Reach out. What can I do to help uh, on it? And street cred is important. But the basic thing will be about uh, uh, the uh, Office of Racial uh, Equity on those type of training things with an offshoot as we build with the street workers. But I, I, I felt so it's not a the funding. It's a reallocation of money, which can be handled. The police department could handle that. Because if you start cutting too deep in any departments, now all of a sudden services are affected to our residents and, and business community. And the council did make another cut 
and um, that, that's forcing Commissioner Clapper to, to relook at some popular or consolidation or, or uh, lessening of your popular C3. I created that flex ordinance squad. The neighborhoods love that, love that, and the quality of life issues, the hub and core, which goes to the root causes. Stop it before it gets to uh, police. So that the funding is a, is a, uh, a buzzword that should be taken uh, out of the, uh, uh, the conversation, because as soon as you say the funding, people get defensive. It's reallocation. We, of course we need a, uh, uh, a police department. So I think that's been a tough word. Great. I have uh, a couple of questions. I hear the uh, Facebook listeners asking questions around education, uh, and uh, Superintendent Warwick has stated he'll be back to speak with us in August. And so I hear your questions, and we'll ask uh, Superintendent Warwick uh, questions uh, around education. The, the next question I have uh, for you guys is around uh, the pandemic. Uh, and as we look at how our nation, our country, our commonwealth, and our city has really shifted, uh, I have to commend you. You've done an extraordinary job uh, in leading the efforts in Marisano as well. Uh, tell us about uh, one of the great triumphs that you did. You recognized uh, one of the most vulnerable populations, and that's the homeless community. So tell us about what you implemented to really help the homeless community during the pandemic. Well, I think uh, the conversation really started uh, with Mayor Sarno. So I'll have to give uh, Mayor Sarno credit early on for understanding that we needed to move quickly because initially uh, we first started, we knew that potentially we were going to have a challenge in the homeless population as far as positivity was concerned. However, we looked at the data from Worcester and we looked at the data from Boston. And what we saw was large numbers of homeless individuals testing positive. And so we, uh, as a city, uh, with the mayor's, through the mayor's direction, uh, stood up tents down at um, Worthington Street. STCC uh, allowed us to use their parking lot. And I will tell you that these uh, tents, although I call them tents, I call them facilities as well. They had air conditioning, they had heat, there were three of them, one for persons under investigation who were waiting for results, the, the second one for individuals who were COVID-19 positive, and then a testing tent. The city of, and city of Springfield, uh, through our partners, Mercy Medical Center and Bay State Health, um, uh, tested about 200 uh, individuals, actually 187. We had 11 individuals come back positive. That's about a 6% uh, positivity. That is much lower than Boston or Worcester. So we were fortunate in this city that we did not have the numbers that we thought we were going to have to be able to stand up be, because we stood up the tents thinking that we could take 75 in each one of those particular tents. Uh, that didn't happen in the city of Springfield. The uh, agencies and organizations that we work with, um, which is Mercy Medical Center uh, and Open Door, Open Pantry, uh, do an excellent job with the homeless. And we call them, uh, for the most part, unsheltered because they don't have shelter. Um, and obviously, they're very transient population. Um, and we were very, very fortunate uh, with the numbers that we have. And I'll let Marisano speak to uh, the process that we use in order to stand up the tents. Well, I, again, I, I always call her the elegant and eloquent one, uh, Helen. I remember it was Sunday night, March 12th, I believe, when we got the call from TV22. Mayor, we need the, the orders have come down, and and uh, Helen and I did live interviews there, and then immediately after that, in my office assembled was 7:30 or 8 o'clock in the evening. All the cabinet heads, and I can't say enough about my cabinet heads and the rank and file, tested and true to a number of natural man-made disasters. We knew what to do, though. This was a different animal. We the other things, the tornado, the freak nor'easter, the explosion. We knew what hit us, and we knew how to. We knew how to hit back. This one was a different animal. So what happened, uh, Mercy, I'll have to reach out to the mayor. We're going to have a homeless crisis occur. We need help. We need your help. We need help, Helen, you, we need your help. 
We didn't want to wait. So we immediately uh, 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 funded, and as I did with other uh, natural man and man-made disasters, don't worry about the money. I have to do, we have to do whatever we have to do for our residents and our business community immediately. We'll go after every reimbursement time I get my hands on after the fact. We stood up these state-of-the-art, these were triage medical tents. And Helen was down there practically every day. Helen, Pat Sullivan, Tim Sheehan. And she, she's very humble. She forgot to mention, too, that friends, uh, the uh, Springfield Rescue Mission, Ronnie Willoughby reached out, Mayor, we need, we need help. Salvation Army reached out, that we need help on it. So we tested probably south of 250, 250 vulnerable population, homeless population. I think we had, it was about 11, because we saw the numbers in Boston and Worcester in the hundreds, and we made sure on that. So I'm very proud of that. Now, we were, Helen and I were questioned. We were questioned. The so-called advocates, what are you, you're not doing enough, why are you doing this or that? It's, it's like, I'm not a chess player, but a checkers player. These moves were made, and now, She's always about facts, data-driven, the proofs in the pudding. It worked out very, very well. But Helen's guidance has been tremendous. And this is something, as we do with the other natural man-made, is that 24-7. We're doing the right thing here. Knock on wood, Governor Baker has done the right thing. I think when we came in, it meant, I, Massachusetts, or, we're looked upon as a national model, what we're doing here. We've got to stay vigilant. We've got to stay vigilant. So... Um, you know, I'm just, I'm very proud of my cabinet heads all the way down the rank and file that have been there, uh, daily we've been doing this. But the homeless thing was important. And uh, uh, to Helen, and to let me, homeless providers, friends of the homeless, the COS, uh, I believe, uh, and, and Bay State, Bay State and Mercy were absolutely fantastic. When we asked them, I needed testing, open up testing for our residents. They did that down in the North End. We did it up on uh, Mason Square. We did it on High Street, first responders, they were on front lines. And we had to make sure we preserved and protect our workforce for the residents' business community. So Bay State stepped right up, Mercy. John Cook, the president of Springfield Technical Community College, when I called, they didn't hesitate, Board of Trustees. I said, please, I need that strategically located. I need that for tenting. So, but the, again, the linchpin of this and, and the leadership on these issues, again, Helen's, Helen has been my point person on this COVID-19 uh, coronavirus pandemic attack to defeat it. So, Commissioner Harris, let me ask you this question regarding the testing protocol. Uh, so I've read something around probable cases, and how has that changed in how we report um, the tests that are given now? So uh, confirmed cases are cases that have a positive um, COVID-19 test. The probable cases use serology, as well as symptoms to get to the positive. So it, right now, in the beginning of the pandemic, DPH, the State Department of Public Health, was not using the probable language. They were simply using confirmed. But they found that there were cadre where the serology was positive or the antibodies were positive, and then the individual had symptoms as well. And so they are now probable. And that is where they're giving us the total numbers um, at this point. So that is the difference. Positive uh, test result period, then the serology and other factors then come into the prob probable. They are now being combined together and they are the total case, um, case rate. Let me also just back up a minute and say that uh, for eight weeks, Mayor Sarno had his cabinet meeting every morning at 9.30 in order to, and I need to say that because it was every morning at 9.30, to, um, to talk about COVID-19 and everybody um, had input. While I, uh, I agree and I was the point person just in terms of it's a public health issue and public health issues, I become the incident commander. but. The entire cabinet, um, there was no not meeting at 9.30 in the morning. This may have been the first week um, since the pandemic began that we have not met um, every day. So I just want to say that uh, we've had a vigilant um, uh, cabinet as well as an individual who said, you, we will, we'll meet every morning until uh, we don't need to meet every morning. And as you know, the case races, uh, rates in the 
um, Commonwealth are really at a place that we're very pleased about. Uh, we talk about being vigilant, but we also know that we have got to stay uh, with those non-pharmaceutical interventions that are working, hand hygiene, face covering, staying home um, if you're sick, and the physical distancing. People are tired of hearing this, I say this, Pastor, but this is what is working, and this is why we need to um, keep working to make sure that we're continuing to, to do that. So I want to just let you know that Mayor Sarno was on top of the fact that we all uh, were in the room every morning while um, I had colleagues that had the opportunity to fade in and out because we were going to Skeleton Cruise. We didn't want people um, you know, together in, in certain spaces, so we were rotating staff in some places. Not us. We were there every morning at 9.30. Thank you. <laughs> Can I just say, too, when Helen Shop, to, to all your viewers out there, we're still doing contact tracing out of Helen's very shop. Important. That's very, very important. You know Helen, okay? The people that are calling you, you know them. So we need the contact trace if you're that. So that way we can uh, isolate and be able to community mitigate. But So if you get a phone call, it's coming from Helen's shop. And, and they want to make sure, you know, who would you, so they can contact those people and make sure the proper precautions are being taken. So we kill, we starve this virus. That's great. Thank you, guys. L let me ask you this question around testing. One of our Facebook uh, audience has a question around, uh, do you need a primary, to be referred to by your primary care? How is testing done and how available uh, or wide availability, what's the availability of testing for our residents? So there was a point when we were testing just um, symptomatic individuals that doctors were referring. At this point, we are able to test anyone but with a doctor's note. So we are no longer asking the question about symptoms. If you call your primary care physician and say, for whatever the reason, I would like to be tested, that physician should be able to give um, an order in order for a person to be tested. Bay State Health still has um, three sites that they are, one is at Riverview, Carew Street and High Street. Caring Health Center in our South End is doing testing as well, but they are testing, uh, to my knowledge, their patients at this point. But there is testing availability, so I would encourage individuals who feel as though they need to uh, be tested for uh, reasons to call their primary care physician and ask for a doctor's order so that you can be tested because you can uh, get a test, um, and there are testing sites that are available. All this information is on the city's website. We post daily all this information to contact, and even, I know, Pastor, you mentioned on Echo Dev, the, we put out $1.225 million to help our businesses uh, this last round of reopen. I wanted to take care of our residents. Uh, Two million, again, the conduit there is, we're putting it through wayfinders for mortgages, for rents, for utilities, and uh, Talia reminded me today, I did do a little tease last week or the week before. Workforce development. Another thing Helen opened my eyes to is this COVID-19 coronavirus, uh, the workforce development disparities for the uh, black and brown faces. So Tim Shea, my chief development officer, we're going to put together a, a uh, amount of money working with the old uh, uh, REAP. It's Mass Hires, Dave Cruz, for a workforce development plan. I'm hoping, until he asked me today, I'm hoping to announce that sometime later in July. So this goes to the root causes, what Helen's going to tackle, the Office of Racial Equity. Education, opportunity, uh, housing opportunities, health opportunities, economic development opportunities. So we, we get to the root causes. Thank you. If I can just very quickly, because the mayor mentioned the prime the pump, um, this, this round that's going on right now is helping businesses that were closed down because of coronavirus, helping them open back up. And so the... Um, the deadline to apply for that funding is actually July 3rd, which is Friday, at noon, I believe. Um, check the city's website, but I believe that it is Friday at noon. Um, if, if that information is not up there, I would say call the mayor's office and we yeah, can get that should, information for you. it should be up you. there. I know the deadline's sometime this week. Now, remember, City Hall, and we've been open since I, City Hall is closed in observance of, of the 4th of July, Friday. So we are open tomorrow. And, and uh, 
The appointments have gone very, very well. Constituents love it. I talk to them when they're coming in, if I see them in City Hall, and departments love it. We will follow opening guidelines, whether city buildings or private buildings, uh, through the edicts coming from uh, 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 Governor Baker, a health perspective, and through Helen. So right now, we're in the second half of phase two. Phase three starts six Monday on it. So, uh, and I think it's a new normalcy. We'll get to phase four. Phase four will be formal normalcy when a vaccine, which they will create, a vaccine is uh, created. But Helen indicates we might not see that fall, winter or even going into the beginning of 2021. I mean, Helen can speak of that. There are a lot of, um, as you know, testing trials going on across the country and it appears, across the world actually, and it appears that everyone is um, obviously racing to get a uh, credible vaccine. And there are some promising uh, vaccines that are in uh, trials. They have not been to the degree that the outcomes, um, the last one they tested, um, used the vaccine on about 35 people and 33, I think, um, were able to um, have the antibodies. However, that's a very small sample, and we've got to have um, larger uh, samples in order to know. But I'm, I'm confident uh, that everyone is working diligently on getting a vaccine and that we will have one. Pastor, can I take a moment to talk about contact tracing briefly? Um, so at the Department of Health and Human Services, there are 351 boards of health in the city of Spring, I mean, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The Department of Health and Human Services is one. All communicable diseases go through my department. So the state reports are communicable diseases, and one of them is COVID-19. Every day, I get a list of COVID-19 individuals who are positive. It then becomes my staff's job, and they do an amazing job, uh, to make sure they are contacting every individual who is positive and those individuals that they had contact with. What we need to be able to do in order to really gauge the penetration of this virus is, number one, we need a universal testing. We have to be able to test uh, the populations, particularly in those hot spots, so that we understand the penetration of the virus in the community. But um, so once we get a positive test, we call that individuals who gives us their contacts, and then we trace them. Our staff calls them to um, alert them and make sure that they are quarantining themselves. So the positive person is isolated. If you are COVID-19 positive, you are isolated. Your contacts then are quarantined, which are the two different. So when the mayor says when my staff calls or they receive that call, it's really important that um, individuals respond and give us the information that we need. We are not trying to get in anybody's business. And sometimes we think, well, they just want to know who I was around. I mean, we are guarded. Our history with the medical system is one of distrust on many levels. And so I understand that. But that information is not shared with anyone. We just use it to be able to make sure that we are getting a handle on the penetration of the virus. Helen also, besides her dedicated staff, you know, recruited through Superintendent Warwick, the school nurses were helping us out too. So I just, when the call comes, it's coming from us, from Helen's shop. Uh, not, uh, and if you ever have any questions, just get a hold of my office. But we want to make sure that uh, that individual and the people in contact with them are okay. Simple as that. That's plain and simple. Thank you. Uh, any final thoughts? All right, I want to thank uh, Commissioner Colton Harris, Mayor Sarno, and Attorney G for being here tonight. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for all of your wonderful questions. We ask that you like and share uh, tonight's conversation as we continue uh, to move forward as a community of people. So thank you for being here. God bless, uh, and may the peace of God be with you. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you for having us.